Hi, I'm Mohit Kirk. I am the founder and CEO of Oloid. There is a common investing thesis in the VC world called India for the world. It means investing in companies that are building in India for global markets, spending in rupees and earning in dollars. One of the pioneers of this thesis is a company called Mindtickle. Mindtickle was founded in Pune in 2009 by a bunch of engineers who were pretty clueless about business. But they kept at it and this is the story of how they found market fit, how they scaled to the US market and became a unicorn. In this two-part episode of the Founder Thesis podcast, your host Akshay Dutt speaks to Mohit Garg about his journey of founding Mindtickle and scaling it up in the US as an enterprise SaaS business. You will also find part two of this conversation on the same feed, which covers Mohit's journey of building his second startup, Oloid. So I had uh, multiple offers all in software. I took up a job in a company in Chennai called Future Software. I felt like systems programming is where I had a lot of interest. So building uh, not application software. And I ended up building software for routers and switches, networking and protocols. Tell me about that uh, journey, you know, from first job to entrepreneurship when you started buying tickles. In those days, you almost had to earn the right to start a business because there was no funding available. And then I also wanted to pursue masters. So even for that, I had to do some savings and find some way of funding my postgraduate education. So as I was working at Future Software, I started preparing for my master's in electrical engineering at Stanford. At uh, Stanford, I took courses in Dubbly and one of the professors, uh, Dr. Paul Raj, he was starting a startup. So he offered a couple of us in the department because he knew like we are... Uh, just moved from India. We don't have a lot of resources. So ended up doing my master's with no loan, right? Ended up taking two and a half years to do my master's because I was working full time. Then I got into the startup world. This is early 2000s and uh, worked with that company. That company did amazingly well. They were building wireless technology called WiMAX. Uh, the company got acquired by Intel and uh, ended up working with Intel for a short while. And then... Uh, Another company, L3 Communications, then acquired the assets of the company because the dot-com burst. Uh, and I ended up working with a large company called L3 Communications. But that's when I realized working with a large company is not my thing. So within a few months, switched to another startup called Aruba Networks. And uh, I had set a benchmark for me, which is I'll go to US for five years, gain an experience, and go back to India and start my business. That was my original plan. Like, Came upon eight years, I said, was bad ho gaya. Now I should stick to my plan, otherwise I'll be here forever. And that's when I had been hearing about ISB as uh, an institute which was being built to global standards. And some of my friends who had an MBA, they advised me and they said, you'll spend a lot of money on US MBA. Because in my mind, again, I was still op operating with some very you know, high level assumptions that to be a business person, you need to have a business degree. And uh, I said, I want to get an MBA. But uh, given that I wanted to build a business in India, I felt ISB will be giving me the best of both worlds. And then uh, 2005, I moved back to India, uh, basically said bye bye to US. That was my plan to just be in India from that point onwards and went to pursue a one-year uh, MBA program at ISB Hyderabad. So while at ISB, I was very clear that I am not going to go for the coveted jobs of consulting and investment banking. Did apply for an exchange program and ended up going to Kellogg School of Business as an exchange student from ISB just for the experience. And that's where at one of the socials, I met the consulting partners at a consulting firm called Diamond Consultants in Chicago. I was doing the exchange program at Kellogg at Chicago and this uh, partner in the consulting firm, he brainwashed me in one hour. So he showed me on consulting in that one hour 
And then he said, next week we have interviews at Kellogg. Uh, I'll recommend you. You put in your resume. So I did the same. Got interviewed at Kellogg. Got a consulting offer. So almost four years, more than four years of uh, managing consulting at a uh, consulting firm in Chicago. Yeah, I can see PwC also on your LinkedIn. Yeah, so in 2010, PwC acquired Diamond Consultants. Diamond Consultants was a boutique consulting firm. I enjoyed it because it was just 500 or so consultants. We were doing very high quality work. And as a small consulting firm, uh, we were very focused on quality and not scale. And then once PwC acquired, obviously it was a massive cultural shift. Uh, the company was operating at massive scale and I could see that the experience is not going to be the same, right? But at this point, I felt I had checked all the boxes for me to take the plunge. Having earned consulting salary for four months, it was pretty rewarding. I had a pause test to say, I can now, you know, be two years, three years without a salary and it's okay. I, I can survive handsomely while being an entrepreneur. And you were still on an H1B visa? Back then, if you had a master's and you applied for a green card, that was pretty quick. So the wait times were not that long. So before I went to ISB, I had already uh, taken a green card in the US. And that was an option value to say, okay, you know, uh, even if I have to come back, travel, everything will be easy. So at ISB, I made some of my uh, like lifelong friends, some very, very close friends. One of those... Uh, people is Krishna, Krishna Depura, who was my co-founder at uh, Mindtickle. And at ISB itself, we had sort of made a pact that we will do a startup together. We had done a lot of business plans together. In fact, there are three, four of us who were, you know, branded as, you know, they want to found companies, they have a plan. Uh, so we were part of that pack. And at least Krishna and I kept in touch. And uh, we always used to talk about what's happening in his life and does he feel ready. So that was leading up to, okay, you know, let's start figuring out the team. Let's figuring out which area. Let's do some market research. So I actually did my return to India second time and packed my bags and moved to Pune uh, where Krishna was already there. Krishna had two other colleagues of his at the startup he's working with called Popmatic. Deepak and Nishant, who were also very good friends. So they also came along. And uh, all four of us, we co-founded together. So we all had done some experiments. For, for like kids? So like for what segment? Yeah, so the experiments we ran in 2010 were around using gamified learning for general knowledge, for... Uh, learning about history, we ran a gamified contest around Indian history. So we had a hypothesis that we'll build something about gamified learning. And we didn't know which segment, whether it's going to be kids, whether it's going to be corporate. So we did experiments in all those areas. At that point, we felt with kids, there was so much academic focus. We didn't want to build any programs for like... Uh, you know, eighth grade mathematics and how to crack boards or how to crack G. That didn't excite us. We believed in holistic learning. And we did our own primary research and we felt like parents weren't willing to pay for holistic education and learning. Right? They'll pay for cracking the exam. And that didn't excite us. So after doing some initial experiments around B2C learning, gamified learning, like we still have you know, Facebook pages we had created, which have 40,000 followers even today, right? Uh, and we were getting like, you know, some of the gamified uh, programs that we created, Facebook games that we created, like they used to get like 15,000 concurrent users. So we had a lot of engagement, but monetization wasn't clear to us. It, it seemed like uh, building this concept for an enterprise B2B uh, will have the grounding of a successful business. Otherwise, they'll end up being a hobby. So then that's the time when we actually built some form of a pitch deck. Uh, when is this uh, when you decided to pivot to B2B? Yeah, so very early on, I would say in the first year itself, uh, you know, we were still not incorporated. We were still doing experiments. So I think 
And who was uh, coding? Like, if you made a Facebook game and all that, you you guys like there were four of you, so all of you knew how to code and all, or like what? Yeah, so Deepak and Nishant, they you know are very very versatile. You know, from a technology standpoint, uh, Nishant is a great designer. Deepak is multifaceted. He you know is everything from an architect to a programmer, uh, and now. You know, very strong CTO, and we also had a couple of early team members that we brought on board. You know, very very early career, very motivated. Those engineers have done amazingly well. So with about six of us, uh, we rented a small little bungalow, and we used to hang out there, and we used to code, and we used to do wireframing of uh, gamified learning games. And we started pitching this concept to uh, HR departments in Bangalore. So we said, uh, initially we pitched team engagement. We said, we will do online team building using our games. So because our games are, uh, we looked at the demographics because our games were seeing more and more of participation from uh, early professionals, right? So also factor of the network, like Krishna had an amazing uh, network in Microsoft and Pubmatic and the word was spreading around around these games and they were Facebook games. So the sharing was happening in those Facebook groups, a uh, lot of posts. And these were like essentially trivia games. Trivia games, mostly general knowledge trivia games. So we, that's what we showed to this HR uh, department we said, check the audience, check the engagement, see how much passion people bring. We had discussion boards and people were doing discussions around trivia even at 2 a.m., right? We said, uh, imagine we could do this for your employees, for employee engagement. We got some early adopters who got excited and Mobi was one of our very early adopter customers who said, okay, we'll give it a shot. Let's do a team engagement game. We did that for HP, for Yahoo. And one thing was very clear that the user engagement was very high. Consistently, whatever we were building, all users were asking for more. They're asking their HR department the next time we're going to have an activity like this. And that's when the name MindTickle also came about. Right. This is December 2011 is when we incorporated the company. And by then we had clarity that it's about gamified learning. Right. Uh, by then we were convinced it's going to be a B2B company. One of our classmates, uh, Neera Jarora, ended up being an initial angel investor. When we shared the idea with him, he got pretty excited. He brought in Amit Somani, who runs Prime Angels now. Uh, he was the second angel investor. So that's where the story started taking off. Very soon after, uh, Excel India gave us a seat check. They said, uh, you know, we like the team. We know there is something there, what you guys are doing. Yearly user engagement is very high. We, we want to back you as an early team. Go figure it out. We'll give you some funds to go figure it out. So now we've got some investor money. So now we've got to get serious and deliver on some objectives and i would say uh, the resources available today are maybe 1000 times more than were available in 2011 so back then we you know had limited uh, access within india everything you're consuming was from us blogs and us founders we started consuming those and i think that's when started understanding the 101s of what a tech startup is so it was a fast learning curve Right, starting to understand, okay, what we are doing, putting stuff on AWS is actually called a cloud-based SaaS service. So even like that thing, it wasn't like a household name, SaaS, now everybody knows, right? So just putting some nomenclature around the category of business, what are we building, enterprise software, uh, building something initially as a HR software, understanding what is the ecosystem, right? Also understanding how should we price it and charge it, right? Because initially we started looking at a event-based pricing. Okay, you know, in Mopi, do a team engagement event or a new hire event, online event, and you give us a per event. After we got funded, started to understand, you know, met with people like Shekhar Kirani, who had just Freshworks was funded, I think within plus minus two months of Pinnacle getting funded with Axel India. So Shekhar started sharing all the insights about, okay, how is, or the Zoho people thinking about their business, right? 
go meet with Girish, pick up his brains and understand because he's further along in the curve of understanding how this model is cracked. So with the Axel Network, we started getting access to learning resources, meeting people who were much more educated and savvy, and uh, also started figuring out geography. You know, that whole romantic model of India is my market to now understanding you're an enterprise software. There is very little success to be had as an India-only focused enterprise software or SaaS company, right? Pretty much all companies look at US as a market, right? So, you know, started with that patriotic zeal of building something for India to then understanding, okay, now the responsibility towards delivering value to investors. You can't do that until you crack the US market. So then once you had an, uh, you know, initial product, initial product was a new hire onboarding product. So we actually productized it. What we were doing as team engagement, you know, sort of one time and done type of uh, gamified learning. We started going into recurring learning model as new hires come into the organization, how you're educating the new hires about their company, their product, uh, their competition, everything they have to learn as a new hire to get an understanding of uh, the company's uh, must know information. We were delivering a gamified manner. So that had decent uptake. And this uh, this was like text plus uh, quizzes, like some text information and some then multiple choice uh, questions and you select one and with some animations when you select the right answer. Like, well, what was it like? So we had done uh, pretty much from day one, everything visual, right? To give you an example, one of the team engagement games that Mindtickle was still doing until a couple years back, maybe they're still doing today was one of those classic games we invented called High Fly. So High Fly was a trivia game, very visual, where you keep on answering questions and your balloon rises and different teams, they have hot air balloons and they're competing, right? Whose balloon reaches the top the f- fastest. So there was always a visual journey component to you know, what we were building, the games and gamified learning we were building, right? Uh, and then we had done a lot of thinking around different formats of games. It shouldn't be MCQ. MCQ was the most boring format, right? Let's find Hangman. Let's find, you know, fill in the blanks. And like we had created a lot of these. See, our DNA was product thinking. Our DNA was build once and reuse. So we had created frameworks about everything, right? Everything was a journey. Then you had journey, you had a background. You could have the background of, you know, a mountain that you're ascending, right? You could have the background of a nice bicycle ride like Tour de France, right? So we had created this product where you could create custom background with the company's logo and upload an image, a JPEG, and it tailored the experience to that company's new hires. It didn't feel like it was a one-size-fits-all, right? It feel like that company's brand, colors, and everything. It was very easy to customize. It made it very customizable. And this, uh, the... The questions were uh, put in by the company HR or, or was it like done by you for them? Yeah, so we started creating frameworks and saying typically onboarding has these five different things about the company, its history. So we would give them a template and ask them to fill a template. We had templatized the whole model uh, and then soon enough we made it self-service whereas you put in the questions, you put in the answers, you do the scoring, right? Everything became like a, uh, you know, what we know today as a templatized uh, SaaS software, right? With the admin portal. And what were you charging companies like per person onboarded? So every new hire batch, we would make like a, you know, thousand dollars for every batch of, you know, whatever 50 people who were coming in. And uh, how did you start selling in the U.S.? This you're talking of U.S. pricing, right? So we did have breakthrough with U.S. companies with offices in India. So everything from Yahoo to, you know, HP, like multinationals, multinational technology companies is where we had our initial traction. And then we went to the U.S. counterparts and said, oh, your Bangalore office had a lot of success with this. So that's how we started penetrating uh, U.S. market. And as we were also getting more savvy about understanding how to build a meaningful business, we needed to be a line item in the budget. So we started quantifying Are we able to get onboarding done faster? Are employees becoming productive faster? Can we introduce product training? Can we introduce sales training? Can we introduce not just about my company's basics done in four hours, 
to now meaningful modules, right? And we started to have business value discussions saying, okay, we'll price to value and talk to HR about business value and time to onboarding. But we realized HR was not the buyer who thought like that and bought like that, at least back in the day, right? Whereas the sales teams who were using our product, they were very excited to engage in a discussion about saying, okay, my sales hire takes four months to be productive. If you can shave off a month from it, I can quantify that. I think that was a light bulb moment for us. The moment we felt like we could quantify the impact into dollars, now we can build a meaningful business. So we started moving more and more towards sales-oriented learning programs, uh, sales onboarding. We put a lot of energy into understanding the sales persona. What is the sales hire? What, what are the different programs that they learn, right? There is uh, sales techniques that they have to learn. They have to learn about competition, pricing. So those modules that started about companies' history, vision, they started morphing into uh, product differentiation, competition, pricing. So a lot of energy started going into pursuing that persona from a new hire perspective. And then we said, why only new hires? The product was uh, not imparting knowledge as such, but it was doing uh, like a fun ways of assessing knowledge. And that assessment in a way also reinforced the knowledge. Yeah, so we actually uh, added modules for even delivering the content. So we started investing into abilities to create content directly, uh, be able to import Google Slides or import PowerPoint and then later on import videos, embed uh, video links. So it started taking more and more the format of a full learning platform. It was gradually morphing towards becoming like an LMS, but uh, a, a more gamified LMS than what would have been around those days. Yeah, I would say that we actually got the award for best uh, gamified learning platform. Uh, I think it must have been 2013, right? So from a gamification standpoint, we were way ahead of the curve. But then we also realized that LMS is not something we want to be. We want to be more than LMS. Right. We want to be a platform which is driving value. So that's why today it's called a sales readiness platform because learning is a small part of it. Right. As we started understanding this persona, just knowing my company's product and being able to, you know, rattle off my company's features doesn't close a deal. So what closes the deal? What makes us new hire successful? What makes a salesperson uh, achieve quota? We started to understand that there are many frameworks around this, right? The frameworks around uh, how is this person able to communicate value? So we introduced the ability for new hires to record themselves, like I'm speaking with you, start the recording on their laptop, record a video and submit it. And the managers can review it and give them feedback, right? We called it missions. So it went from trivia-based learning to sort of, gamified e-learning to now learning which impacts outcomes, makes salespeople productive and effective sellers, right? Making the best videos. So if I was, let's say, a sales team of 70 people, there are three star sellers, right? Their videos are available for me to play and learn from, right? So peer-to-peer -peer learning became a very important part of the platform, right? Then we did integration with platforms like salesforce.com. And now content could be tied to what type of deals am I selling? Am I selling in pharma? Am I selling in manufacturing? So then the videos and content related to pharma case studies will become available to me. So a little bit of content management feature started coming into it. What, uh, what question here? Uh, how did this uh, content library get built? Uh, so this you're saying is like user-generated content, like the learners would at the time of uh, when a company signs up, then everyone goes through the module and they submit their videos. Uh, and uh, uh, those videos which people submit uh, as part of the assessment, that gets added to the content bank. Yeah, so we realized that we can't rely on just company-provided content, right? We need to invest into user-generated content and crowdsourcing of content. So exactly to your point, I may be sales hire number 431, right? But there are 430 people who were hired before me. 
of those 430 people, some of the videos must have been really good and spectacular. So it doesn't have to be people who joined with me in my batch, but historically best examples need to be highlighted. So there was a voting system, there was a grading system, there was a rating system. There was ability to boil up the best piece of content that drives success, which are good examples to learn from. So we, we invested in several principles. We had discussion boards where no hires could ask questions and there could be meaningful discussion. So we started with this notion of, uh, you know, we used to call it Sogamo, which is social gamified mobile. So we tried to coin a word Sogamo learning, right? So at this point, you know, we had cracked the code of learning. We knew that in online learning, we are the champs. What we are starting to realize is we are more than learning. How, how do those case study videos get in? Uh, because you're collecting videos as part of uh, uh, onboarding journey for a new customer, right? Like where, where there would be some questions and as an answer to the question you record, like say communicating value, you give an example. But how does that, how do, how do the case studies enter the system? So today, developing success stories or case studies is a very formal process in organizations, right? Because sales enablement, sales enablement, you can say is the company setting up their salespeople to, for success is sales enablement. And how do you set your salespeople with successes? The first thing is you have to deliver a compelling product and value proposition. You have to deliver a pricing model that is attractive and it's compelling. And you have to now deliver narratives with the salespeople can use. Right? So narrative is not just a pitch, right? It's not just about saying my product is better and so forth. It's about we have worked with customers like you and they have been successful. So that's a case study. So today there's a standard process in organizations where customer success teams, they are rewarded and compensated for making their customers referenceable. When you make a customer referenceable, they'll either do a G2 crowd review for you or if they are even more intimate with you, they'll give you a video testimonial of some sort, right? And then you also have processes, best companies also have processes where as soon as a salesperson closes a deal, they will record a win story and say, I sold to the CIO, I had a three month sales cycle, we had this type of evaluation, we were competing against this competitor because we had this ability to respond to this customer's business needs, have this feature, we won against this competitor. So all of these now studying packaged as codified learning, as videos. And now in a platform, we had the ability to import them and boil them up at the moment of need, right? So we also came up with a lot of interesting taglines saying, preparing sales reps for the moment of truth. Moment of truth is in front of a customer. So how do you prepare them? You prepare them with the right content, right learning, right narratives. It's called command of the message, command of the sale. There's a lot of frameworks around sales effectiveness. So all of those we incorporated into our platform. It became much, much more than an LMS. This data was like already labeled. You, you didn't have to work around labeling it uh, like in, in order to identify which video should be shown when that, that labels are important, right? That is where you build a valuable company, right? Because now you're taking all of this, you know, sort of I'm summarizing in five minutes for you. But all of this institutional knowledge of what drives sales success, right? Our early customers were Nutanix, Cloudera, AppDynamics. These companies had the best sales teams in the US SaaS ecosystem. So working with their sales enablement leaders, working with their sales training teams, working with their sales leaders and understanding what drives sales success got codified as templates in our platform. So now if a new company who's, you know, earlier in their journey or doesn't have that high caliber salespeople, they have templatization of best practices from best in the breed. So our customers actually helped us become smarter, right? We were not sales experts, right? But we had worked with high quality sales teams as customers. And we were smart enough to absorb what they were telling us and make them features in a product, make them templates. So essentially you are making sales best practices available as a subscription to companies. Yes, we implemented all the best practices in a templatized manner for organizations to take advantage of. Give me some examples of what kind of features allowed companies who did not follow best practices to start following them. Give me an example of some product features which help salespeople to become 
uh, more effective. Like one, of course, you've told me like the Salesforce integration that you know, serving up content. Uh, what else? Yeah. So there's another I mentioned, which is about being able to record yourself and get feedback. That is a very effective tool for a new salesperson, right? Because when you are joining a new company, having the right narrative about how to even do a basic description of what is the company about, right? Why is this differentiated? Why is it better versus competition for a certain set of customers? Who are some examples of uh, companies who are using the product successfully? Some of those basic narratives, fine tuning those narratives without putting them through a human process in a classroom, right? Doing at their own pace. I think the next generation sellers really resonated with that because prior to that, the old generation sellers were sitting in a classroom and doing pitch practice. Being able to do it on my computer in my own time, uh, I, I think unlocked a lot of value. So that, you know, we used to call it missions, right? Uh, pitch practice. That was a very, very useful feature our customers took advantage of. Uh, like now, my article has features where their integration with Zoom and other recording software, where AI would analyze the meeting and then you would get data. Okay. So like the, the live uh, sales pitch is getting recorded and analyzed. Right. So conversational AI, where now you can do assessment of what percentage of the time did the customers speak, what percentage of time did the salesperson speak, right? How many times was uh, a competitor mentioned, right? How long was the pricing discussion, right? Uh, the opportunities are endless, right? You can do emotion analysis. There are opportunities to also start providing uh, prompted content based on the conversational AI. You are in a meeting and then uh, AI can prompt you on content that would be useful or, you know, references to case studies or customers that would be useful. Okay, got it. So uh, you were uh, in Pune when you started. Uh, how did you land up in the U.S. then? So after we realized that we have to succeed in U.S. as a market, uh, 2013, we already had customers in India, multinationals in India who were giving us referrals to speak to their U.S. counterparts. So I started uh, making trips in U.S. to meet with these companies and meet the U.S. teams. So I did like two or three trips in that year, 2012-2013 time frame. And then I think then I ended up doing seven months in the U.S. Uh, because there was like so much of uh, sales discovery that we had to do as we were moving specifically towards the sales uh, enablement market. We realized there's a lot of customer discovery to be done. So I spent seven months, my family was at Pune and I had a child who was just born. So it was just not working out from a personal standpoint, being away with a very young child. So uh, my first one was seven months old when we decided to pack our bags and go to US so the family could be united. Because it was very clear to me that uh, one of the co-founders, whoever is driving the revenue side of the business, uh, will have to be close to the customers, especially because it's a new category, new product, a new customer. And we don't have any proxy for that in India. Right? If we build the product with Indian customers, this will not meet the needs of the core market. So I, I moved to US. Mm. Yeah, India was still like adopting CRM. It was at that stage where CRM was getting adopted. You needed customers who have already got CRM sorted and are looking at next level. Right, exactly right. And, and you were essentially the, the face of the company for customers, like in terms of uh, leading the sales and uh, heading up US sales. I, I'm guessing the sales team would have been largely based in the US. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the... Uh, had a U.S. sales team. We, we had some marketing and SDR, BDR functions in India, but all sellers were in U.S. So, in fact, I was involved in every single deal as a founder seller in the first 50 customers uh, and then obviously started pulled back on founder selling and started to get more into, you know, have sales leaders, a VP of sales, and then you have 
customer success uh, teams and leadership. So it started more and more of the traditional uh, sales team structure. But all of that was built in the US, in the Bay Area. And you were uh, responsible for the fundraising also? Uh, Krishna was leading the charge on fundraising. I was in charge of revenue. So I had a revenue leadership role. Uh, I was tag teaming with Krishna. So we used to always pitch together. But uh, I was focusing on revenue and Krishna was focusing on uh, all the overall company building. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, tell me that journey of pricing. Uh, you you must have uh, like uh, gone through a journey to discover what is the right pricing. Like you initially started with a couple of dollars per onboarding done. And then once you pivoted into the sales model, that what what was the pricing journey like? Yeah, it was very clear to us that we want to do a per user SaaS subscription pricing. Like uh, I think for our uh, software, the end users were sales reps. And if you think about value-based pricing, a company with a larger sales team gets more value from Identical than a smaller sales team. So all that made sense. Uh, the model never got pushed back from customers. What we did realize is this beautiful upsell model where you could start with a basic introductory starter pack with a startup, and then you could upsell them on more sophisticated features like the video recordings and the AI. So we actually went from, you know, like $15 per user to 70 plus $75 per user per month for a full featured product, right? So we were at this time also able to uh, triple our account size going from, you know, $11,000 average ACV to 40,000 plus ACV. Uh, so yeah, that was on account of adding more value to our products and customers appreciating how that impacted sales outcomes. And that's where I would say if we had stayed in a HR centric software, we've not been able to cross this journey, which we've had uh, because we were tied to business outcomes and sales outcomes. Mm, okay. So uh, around 2018 is when you kind of uh, moved out. Uh, at that stage, what kind of uh, ARR was Mindtickle at? How much uh, fundraise had it done? Like, wh what was the state of the company at that stage? Yeah, company had, was at Series C stage. And yeah, we had raised you know, almost uh, $55 million at that point. And uh, yeah, the company... Yeah. This $55 million is a pretty big amount. Uh, this is on the back of uh, that global opportunity, like, like investors would have been interested in Mindtickle as a global SaaS business. Yeah, I would say between 2014 and 18, we had established ourselves as a US-centric business. Like 95% of business was coming from US. Right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you know, we didn't have to justify that it's a global company. We were a US first company. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. And we were a US first company with a very efficient uh, cost model where we had a very strong team in India that could support everything from our customer success, engineering, product standpoint, right? support standpoint. And then we had a front facing, highly effective sales team in the US, it's a marketing team in the US. So we were also capital efficient, not just growing fast, not just a leader in our space as a first mover. We were also very capital efficient. So we got a lot of acknowledgement for being a leader, early mover and being capital efficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, what uh, What was uh, like, what caused you to uh, move out when you had built it up from scratch? So Akshan, my role was that of a chief revenue officer at my title. Right. Founder CRO is a very rare profile, I would say in the tech industry, right? Uh, generally, CROs are career sales leaders who have started their journey in sales or customer success. You know, they've either gone from a cold caller to account seller to enterprise sales rep. Right? They've spent 20 years and then they've led teams, regional RVP, the VP of sales, CRO, right? So for me, as a pure engineering pedigree, having learned sales and driving revenue, uh, VP of sales reporting to me, like that was a very fast learning curve. And it delivered that uh, to the best of my abilities to a point where we were already talking about 
okay, how many years to IPO, how many years to 100 million year, or what does this look like? Because now you're getting some very high quality investors with massive rounds of funding coming to the company. And I think one question every founder should ask oneself is, am I the right person for the role that I'm playing in the company? And I honestly felt I had reached my level of incompetence when it comes to leading revenue as a CRO of the company. I had the opportunity to stay and be relevant as a chief strategy officer. Uh, that was a role that was being discussed. We had just recently hired a president who was taking over day-to-day -day CRO responsibilities from me because the board and I, we felt like we need to take this company and unlock its full potential. I need to get somebody seasoned, somebody seasoned who has seen scale, seen a couple of hundred million of ARR, you know, we were hiring career enterprise salespeople, right? Some of the sales reps we hired, they themselves had single-handedly carried tens of millions of dollars of quota. And, you know, we're reporting into me where I didn't have revenue leadership experience. Uh, I, I felt like we needed somebody seasoned to come and take up this role. And I also felt the value I would add once, you know, we basically ended up with five VPs and one president taking over the responsibilities I was carrying at one point, right? So we hired really well. You know, and I placed myself with very high quality talent. Uh, so I, I felt like it was time for me to also thinking about how I unlock my own potential as a founder and go on the CEO route and see how I can uh, not only impact revenue, but also impact product, impact fundraising, be at the helm of the company, overall company building and not just revenue book of business building. So I felt like that was the right decision and the right time to execute that decision. And that brings us to the end of this conversation. I want to ask you for a favor now. Did you like listening to this show? I'd love to hear your feedback about it. Do you have your own startup ideas? I'd love to hear them. Do you have questions for any of the guests that you heard about in this show? I'd love to get your questions and pass them on to the guests. Write to me at ad at the podium dot in. That's ad at t-h-e-p-o-d-i-u-m dot in. Okay. Okay. So you uh, like stopped playing an operational role uh, and became more of an advisor. Right. That's right. At that point, I had met my co-founder now, Madhu, and he and I had been friends for several years. And he was doing a very interesting startup, which uh, he needed help with on go-to-market. So he was seeking out, uh, reaching out to me for advice. And, you know, I was so impressed with the tech stack that he had built around uh, Bluetooth access technology uh, as, you know, a one founder with two engineers. He had four million downloads of his application using his Bluetooth technology, right? So I was... What was it? Can you describe that product? Yeah, so he had built a product for making hotel room access wireless. So as opposed to using key cards, when you go to a hotel, he had developed an SDK, which went into the, let's say mobile app of Taj. And you go to a Taj hotel, like many of us experience this in Marriott's, you can directly go to your room and you don't have to go to the front desk. So huge amounts of operational efficiency, huge amounts of user experience improvements. And, you know, I, I was very impressed with the technology that he had built. And I could personally connect with the promise of frictionless access to buildings and physical spaces. Hotel market was a tough market to sell into. 
and he was struggling just in terms of how they would treat vendors and not provide the right kind of rewards for his efforts. And while I was advising him on go to market, I kept on telling him that there's a much bigger play in enterprise. There's a much bigger play in the office space. There is so much automation that's starting to happen with co-working spaces and coming off, you know, the modern mobile smartphones. Companies are giving their own phones and devices. Uh, digital identity in terms of username, passwords, it's becoming more single sign-on. So I did believe that you have to build a different company, whether you build it for consumer or for enterprise, it's not the same company. So he said, enterprise is interesting, but I don't know enterprise and I knew enterprise, that's where I come from. So we agreed that if you were to do it together, we'd do it completely fresh. So he brought his technology stack and technology prowess with him. And we uh, started afresh uh, as co-founders. Uh, I discussed this with one of my friends who was my classmate at Stanford 20 years back. And he also came in as a co-founder to lead engineering. My co-founder Madhu took the CTO role. Uh, and we founded Oloid. Uh, to be the single sign-on for physical identity. So what that means, very simply put, is we have G Suite username and password gives us access to Drive, email, you know, spreadsheets and whatnot. Have a similar concept for physical workspaces. So whether it's door, turn styles, time clocks, the same physical identity should give you access to all the resources and infrastructure. So just think about there's so many manual processes we're waiting in queues to to get services in a workplace or in a building, which can be automated. And smartphone is pervasive today. We got super excited about it. In fact, the, the company name that we coined, Oloid, uh, it is online linked offline identity. So I have my online identity, username, password. So we talk about, uh, when we talk to customers, we say, how cool would it be if I could use open this door with my G Suite username password? You actually can do that with a technology stack, right? So it's your taking the online concept of seamless username passwordless access and taking that to the physical world that we got excited about. So what was the MVP? And, uh, I I can understand from the the user who's accessing uh, for him it's like a like an SDK, which can get integrated into a mobile app, like say a Marriott app could have that as you give an example. But what about from the uh, enterprise side, like say the the on, on Marriott side, what would they need to do? Or uh, on a company side, what would they need to do to enable this? Interestingly, our first product was not a Bluetooth or mobile access product. It ended up being a facial recognition based product. So our MVP came from huge pain point in factories around use of badges where workers would come in at 9 a.m. and they would bring their buddies card with them. They swipe theirs, they swipe the buddies. The buddy starts clocking hours and the buddy shows up at noon. So buddy earned three hours of fraudulent payroll. And you know our largest customer now has got 44,000 employees. When they did the math, there was more than $2 million of estimated fraudulent payroll every year, right? So when we talked about digital identity and we shared our ideas with them, they said there is a strong security component there that you're not highlighting. So it's not just convenience, right? So when we came from the hotel visitor experience, this is where I believe consumer and enterprise are different, right? We over-index on just the convenience part in our consumer life. Enterprises need to see business value in terms of savings or revenue generation. And we could hear customers with large hourly workforce articulate this pain point consistently. So our first product was a tablet-based facial recognition product. We call it a smart reader, which turns any tablet, download the Oloid app, and the smart reader now becomes an authentication device. You can mount it on a door, you can mount it on a turnstile, and it will accurately identify the person. You can't hack it by putting a picture in front of it or playing a video on your phone because many of the technologies that were existing had the promise of facial recognition, but they were easily hackable. 
So we built a very robust product uh, based on the iPad platform uh, using the iPad hardware. Uh, and then we started deploying this in factories in North America. We started with California factories, then we deployed in factories entire US, then we deployed in Mexico and Canada. So our initial, uh, what we call as uh, anchor customer, right, design partner, was a very large Fortune 500 manufacturing company. Hmm. Right. That's where I guess the paper hour, I mean, where you have a lot of paper hour jobs is where this makes sense, where the savings can be. Yeah. We talked about mobile technology and they said, you know, in our factories, when our workers come in, we ask them to put their phone in a locker and then enter the factory, right? They are doing manufacturing for the government. They're doing manufacturing for high IP products. People can take pictures and, you know, IP can get compromised. So there's no mobile device on the floor. So we recognize that we have a very interesting problem statement. It aligns with our notion of digital identity. We are not you know, mobile sign-on for digital identity. We are single sign-on. So mobile is just one of the many ways of authentication. So that's where we take a broad vision and view of the world. And we said, let's start with a broad definition of how people authenticate themselves. Facial recognition is very credible for an hourly worker, whereas it's mobile access makes a lot of sense for the knowledge worker in the office. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And uh, I'm guessing facial recognition technology is not something that needs to be built from scratch. It's been around for a couple of years. You would have been able to uh, plug and play some parts of it. That's right. Yeah. So we were able to take existing algorithms partners to build a MVP pretty fast. And, and this is where you start discovering the hard problems and hard problems are really good because that creates value, right? If we were to repackage somebody else's product and just put a skin on it, we are not delivering value, right? So we, I shared with you, we realized problems around presentation attacks where somebody can put a picture and hack a camera, right? We recognize problems around what if connection goes away, the iPad loses Wi-Fi connection. It should still work. We recognize problems around how many data sets can you fit in an iPad? How do you do uh, memory optimization to make sure an iPad can have 20,000 uh, data set and it's not even connected to the cloud? So we solved some very interesting problems around integration, how data goes into a time and attendance system, data goes into a physical access control system. And that's the you know key thing you know for our listeners who think about consumer products and enterprise products. In enterprise products, People call them bells and whistles, but they are really enterprise-grade features which create value, right? Which customers appreciate and they say, yes, you're integrated with Workday, you're integrated with Kronos, you are bringing in this ready pre-integrated features which make my deployment very easy. So those were areas where we continue to add value, right? It's not the facial recognition engine per se, but packaging that into a comprehensive product. Uh does this work with uh, masks? Like, you know, uh, and th there would have been that period where people would have been wearing masks. Uh, what uh, what happens then? Face mask. Yeah, so, you know, part of our selection of factories as our first go-to market, honestly, Akshay, is we built this product in COVID times and offices were not open, right? Whereas factories were open, right? So this was also, you know, a, choice around responding to market realities during COVID. You know, the reality is factories never shut down. But having having said that, uh, we found that there were clear instructions if you could provide user experience where you could prompt people to quickly pull down the mask, like it worked very reliably. And uh, what is the uh, customer onboarding journey? Is it self-service for them? Like Because they need to give you the database of faces, right? So how does that happen? Yeah, the same tablet is also an onboarding device. So the admin can put the same tablet into onboarding mode for a new hire. So they walk the new hire, take them to the tablet and say, uh, I put that into onboarding mode, take that picture, they put in their worker ID and it gets smashed and it goes into our system. So it's a very easy onboarding. Yeah. I mean, onboarding is an area where I think, you know, if you think about KYC onboarding into even B2C apps today, self-onboarding is becoming very, very competent. It's the same thing with a product, right? We see a world where 
a new hire can use their own smartphone, take a selfie, do ID verification, gets onboarded into our system. So uh, this was product one. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I guess 2020 is you, uh, you were selling this product, the facial recognition access control. Okay. And how did it do? What kind of revenues were you seeing from it? How do you price this? Yeah, so it's a subscription model uh, based on number mm -hmm. of employees. We do multi-year contracts. So it ends up being, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. based on number of locations, number of employees, and then you do enterprise license quickly mm -hmm. got to half a million in ARR with this product, right? And wow. that's when okay. we raised a round of funding. Uh, mm -hmm. We raised a round of funding, pitching the entire vision of not just hourly workers, mm -hmm. but also uh, office workers. So just to explain what I'm saying is, if you bring a phone to a door, your phone has Bluetooth, hmm. the door locks don't have yeah. Bluetooth, right? And a big problem statement for any kind of disruption is how easy can you make for your customers to adopt the technology? So we uh, had this concept for which we had already applied a patent for, which is called retrofit mobile access because so far in the physical identity and access industry nobody has ever created a self-install product it is all professional installation an electrician type of trained person union labor will come in and pull wires and put hardware right we said we have the ability to self upgrade and self-install an existing door or turnstile and the customer can place the device on their existing hardware and it would retrofit it and make it Bluetooth compatible. So that's the product we started building after our funding. Uh, it is called MTAG, Mobile Tag. It's the first time I built hardware in my life as a you know, founder, right? I've always been in software, but this felt like it's a marketing enabler, right? So we don't see ourselves as a hardware company. We see ourselves as a you know, SaaS company. So we built a prototype of hardware, first in the world, a battery power device which snaps on an existing badge reader. So if we, when we go to offices, we swipe our card on these black devices which sit on the wall, it's called a badge reader. So we've built a universal adapter where you can put our hardware on top of that badge reader, it snaps on. And once it snaps on, it is able to communicate with the end user's mobile device over Bluetooth. And once that communication is established, it relays the badge ID to that underlying old badge reader as if you swiped your card. So actually you're using a phone, but it's emulating the action as if you swiped your card, right? Makes it totally frictionless, makes it very easy deployment, makes it universally uh, usable. So we built that prototype, we installed it, so uh, how does the badge reader technology work? In what way does the badge communicate to the badge reader that this is my number? Yeah, so the badge has an antenna and when you go take your badge towards a badge reader, that antenna gets excited and the electromagnetic energy energizes the hardware in your badge. It then transmits a set of uh, numbers in an encrypted manner over radio frequency. Okay, it's called RF technology. So this badge then sends it over radio frequency to the badge reader. The badge reader receives it and it decodes that unique ID of that badge, sends it to a backend system, and the backend system says, Yes, this badge ID belongs to Akshay, and Akshay has access to this door. Open the door. So the hardware you built, uh, I'll just ask this question, then you go for your test. Uh, the hardware you built, how did it know what is the encrypted message it needs to send to the badge reader? Because you're saying that there is an encrypted set of numbers being sent to the reader from the badge. Uh, how did your hardware figure out that this is the encrypted set of numbers I need to send? Yeah, so this is where integrations come into play, Akshay. So if, in enterprise, all of this data it's managed in a backend system called access control system. So if you are a new employee who joined an organization, then your badge ID, it is resident in a backend system called access control system. So we built integration with everybody from Linnell to Honeywell to Johnson Controls. And 
we had the ability to pull this data. If you're a new employee who got added to the system, we automatically, Oloid Cloud was able to sync that data, right? Now I know Akshay has been assigned this badge ID. Now I know I can send it over to Akshay's mobile app. Now I know this can be transmitted over Bluetooth to the badge reader, right? So uh, Honeywell had to agree to work with you for this uh, because in a way, uh, it would be like hacking their system, right? So they could uh, put in place restrictions so that you don't, uh, I mean, unless they actively cooperate with you because in a way you're hacking their system, right? Yeah, I wouldn't call it hacking your system. What I would say is it is synergistic at multiple levels, right? So these access control systems, they are on-premise, very hard to integrate with, and customers are demanding integrations, right? Without all over it, it is hard for a customer to make their Honeywell access control system sync with Workday, sync with Active Directory. From a customer standpoint, they have two choices. They could say, hey, I've had this Linnell system or Honeywell or Johnson control systems for 20 years. It doesn't have the latest features or integrations. I'm going to get rid of it and replace it with something totally new and modern. Or they have a choice of, I keep my existing investments, put Oloid on top, and then it becomes a full complete solution. I don't have to rip and replace. So obviously it's very cost effective for the customer, but from you know Honeywell or Johnson Control, you're securing your customer base through a partnership. Amazing. So that was uh, your solution to integrating with the existing enterprise uh, tech or enterprise stack. So you can just build on top of that. So uh, what is your uh, what has been your go to market uh, for both of these products? Yeah. So our markets are large employers of hourly customers and workplaces and the workplaces are serving uh, knowledge workers right? knowledge workers use our mobile solution and hourly workers use our facial recognition solution so for uh, our mobile solution we have partnered with channels and system integrators every industry has a certain industry structure and if you look at physical identity access building management facilities right, they are very deeply entrenched players whose systems you know are very hard to replace right we we are not in the replacement game we're in the augmentation game so we are constantly increasing our set of integrations on the technology side and gtm partnerships on the channel side so we continue to uh, push for all the building use cases almost exclusively through channel for the large enterprise hourly worker use case, it's more of a CIO, CISO cell, top-down selling, more of an account-based motion where we have set of top 50 manufacturers in the US, right? We're looking at additional verticals adding this year and we are going direct. We are going direct, you know, very similar to how we had drilled the enterprise sales motion at Mindicle. Uh, the vice president of sales at Mindicle actually joined me to help me build this out. The head of solutions consulting at Mindicle, he had joined another company and he came over to help build out the uh, solutions consulting practice. So it's a you know still a small team where we have more than a decade experience of working together and building enterprise go to market. So you know. I shared with you that we had a large manufacturing customer who was our initial design partner. They have 44,000 workers, right? Now we recently brought on a 110,000 employee uh, food manufacturing company as a customer, right? So each of these deals end up being seven figures plus and, uh, you know, require several months of committed effort of working and partnering with the customer. It's a very high touch sales, which I enjoy building. Okay, interesting. The uh, uh, mobile access product, uh, uh, what kind of partners are these? Like these are uh, like civil uh, contractors or uh, like people in the civil engineering field who would help in building fit outs and all, uh, who would uh, kind of recommend your product to uh, buildings? Um, so our market is existing buildings, not new installations. So we're not going after new buildings, right? Uh, existing buildings have uh, existing badge infrastructure. So they have 
you know, the backend access control systems, they have wiring and whatnot. So there are companies called system integrators who manage this on an annual contract, right? So these are not civil companies, right? They are you know, uh, certified installers and technicians. And many of these roll up into working with a large vendor like Honeywell, right? They'll be, I'm part of the Honeywell ecosystem, I'm part of the Linnell ecosystem or Johnson Controls ecosystem, right? So we're not going to individual installers, we are going to the large, you know, players in this, and then we're forging partnerships at that level. And once we forge a partnership with Honeywell, as an example, we get access to their 200 regional uh, distributors and installers. Okay. So you said this device was uh, battery powered. Uh, does that battery, is it like a chargeable device or it has like that petzl cell which you can just replace? Or Yeah, so today this comes with a two to three year battery life, which is self-replaceable. So it is a standard battery that can be replaced by the customer themselves. We we are, you know, on version one of our product. In fact, you know, in terms of timeline and chronology, we had built the prototype, was with a few beta customers, then we raised the Series A. And part of the use of the funds was to productize it, right? Go from uh, subscale lab manufacture devices for prototypes into large scale contract manufacture devices so we have launched the version one of our production level hardware uh version two is in the works which will support many capabilities like supporting the apple wallet also uh, energy harnessed battery where you don't have to replace the battery so yeah form factor improvements so this a very interesting roadmap we're pursuing around the version two of, of the product okay so what is an energy harnessed battery so where when you mount it on a badge reader, it is constantly getting charged through electromagnetic rays. The user, the employee, uh, they need to have an uh, Oloid app for the Bluetooth to work or how does it happen for them? Yeah, so today they do require an Oloid app. Uh, we have the ability to provide an SDK. So if the company had their own app or th they were using, let's say, a visitor management app, this could be embedded inside it. We are also planning to support wallets. So once the wallet support is there, I don't need an app. My op Apple wallet could be the key to my door for mobile access. My Samsung wallet or Google wallet, you know, it'd be a very similar experience to how we do mobile payments with our Apple Watch. We don't need an app for that. That that's the direction in which the industry is going, and we are going as well. For uh, this device, you could like directly be selling to say a viewer kind of uh, businesses which are in the uh, like co-working space yeah we've already installed this product in co-working spaces right i think uh, we work obviously would be one of our uh prized prospects because of their scale and footprint right it has huge benefit for single tenant buildings uh i think wherever there is commonly accessed infrastructure. Issuing badges is a big pain point. I have one badge for the elevator, one badge for the turnstile at the entry, and then I have one for my office, right? It just And then add to it, I have three offices and I'm shuttling between offices. Right? It's a big pain point. Providing digital mobile access alleviates a lot of those user experience pain points. In addition to the backend data, right? Just think about it, if I want to do occupancy assessment of my three buildings, which is very important these days. How many people are actually coming to the office? Pulling this data from an old on-premise system is very hard. I have to do, do Excel downloads from a Windows server. So there's a lot of backend modernization benefits, not just like you said, you know, removing the friction for the user. So you could actually help companies to design better workspaces because they would be able to run some analytics on uh what are the most used spaces in a building or uh, what days do most people come in and stuff like that. Okay, okay. So uh, would this also uh, work as a visitor management? Uh, is that on your roadmap? Like, you know, every time you go to a corporate office, they, uh, especially in India, like they would, those DLF buildings that go down. So we already integrate with visitor management systems. We're not in the visitor management space, right? We don't build that application for our customers. 
But if our customer has an Envoy or a Veris or a Sign Visitor Management System, then we integrate with those, right? A uh, person can go to a building, uh, use Veris to fill out their form on a tablet. It will create temporary badge ID credentials, which can be downloaded on their phone. Okay. Uh, do you also see opportunity in... Uh the apartment tech space you know like there are these companies like say my gate geo also reliance also has something called geo gate and so on which again help in visitor management and access control for the residents and so on so from a technology stack standpoint the answer is yes this does extend itself into large managed apartment home communities uh, in fact fewer competitors already serve commercial and they also serve residential from a go-to-market standpoint, you know, I am a big fan of focus, at least in the early years. The buyer's buying process ends up being very different. The pitch ends up being very different compared to the enterprise. We have built deep enterprise integrations, right? We have more integrations than any of our equivalent or comparable competing products. So we want to play to our strengths. So there's 72 million doors just in North America right, in the commercial real estate. So we've not, you know, even tapped into single digit percentages. Right now, we see ourselves focusing almost exclusively on the workplace and enterprise and winning and becoming a very clear leader in that market. Okay. Give me some estimation of your earning or, you know, what, what do you expect to close this year at? And... Yeah. No, so we've grown by 300% last year. We're going to grow by the same measure this year, right? So we're going to be like a 5 million ERR company in the coming year, right? What's on the roadmap for Oloid? Uh, would you look at uh, merging of physical digital access and, you know, like eliminating passwords? Uh, like I, I've been reading for the last 10 years about different companies who want to eliminate passwords. Uh, is that on your roadmap also? Yeah, that's happening already, Akshay. So... Okta Ventures is an investor in Oloid. Uh, with them, we have been working on a joint solution where any Okta customer can bring Oloid into their mix, just like Honeywell brings in as an add-on. And with uh, Okta employees who already have their face onboarded into our system, can not only use it at the door, but they can also use it to sign in to Okta. With biometric identity, you can actually create username less and password less. So it's a level further in terms of uh, the ease of use. Uh, our target market is, as I shared with you, large employers of hourly workforce, but they don't have smartphones. So today, there are really good solutions for password less using the mobile device, right? Hourly workers, factory workers, they don't have the luxury of, you know, having data or a device handy or a company provided device. Fascinating. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of this conversation. I want to ask you for a favor now. Did you like listening to this show? I'd love to hear your feedback about it. Do you have your own startup ideas? I'd love to hear them. Do you have questions for any of the guests that you heard about in this show? I'd love to get your questions and pass them on to the guests. Write to me at ad at thepodium.in. That's ad at t-h-e-p-o-d-i-u-m dot in. 